of a cell phone. They believe a new device has the potential to help in the fight against COVID-19. As Dion Lim found out, the technology is designed to diagnose the virus in a fraction of the time. From the beginning of the pandemic, testing enough people to track the spread of the COVID virus has been slow and frustrating. But what if there was a faster way? Loading the SARS-CoV targeting sample. In a lab at the University of California, researchers are about to demonstrate a device that can not only detect the virus quickly, but also indicates how much is present. All it takes is a marriage of Nobel Prize winning science and consumer electronics, namely a cell phone. And it turns out that the phone cameras, which have been getting better and better and better over time, are just as capable, if not better, than laboratory instruments. University of California bioengineer Dan Fletcher pioneered the use of cell phone cameras to spot and diagnose diseases around the world nearly a decade ago. Now, in the case of COVID, he says the key is having a test result that the phone can see. That allows us uh, to have that molecular recognition and then turn it into a fluorescent signal that the phone camera is sensitive enough to pick up. Enter Melanie Ott and Paranaz Fazuni, virology experts at San Francisco's Gladstone Institute. Gladstone has been at the center of a revolution known as gene editing, triggered by a technology known as CRISPR. You know, CRISPR was discovered in 2012 to be something that we could use for genome editing. And now there's probably very few labs in the world who haven't used it in some application or another. In this version, the team added a CRISPR protein that would react to the RNA or genetic material of the COVID-19 virus. I'll slide it into the sample slider. If it's present, the protein triggers a second reporter molecule to emit a fluorescent signal. And now it's Ready for imaging if we turn on the laser light. Back at the Fletcher lab, the Gladstone test is being coupled with a smartphone camera that can detect the fluorescent glow. And now we are seeing the SARS-CoV-2 line is glowing, indicating this is a positive case. The test took about 30 minutes, but researchers say heavy viral loads have been detected even faster. Gladstone's Melanie Ott says the goal is to have a test that could be used quickly with normal swabs in real world settings. That means a police department, a doctor's office, an airport, a school, an employer, where this device could be uh, used before people enter. And because the device can detect how much virus is present, it could also be used to answer questions like whether someone might still be contagious after receiving a vaccine and for how long. And while there's still testing to be done, researchers are excited about the potential impact a quick and accurate test could have in beating the pandemic. Definitely interesting to think about there. Okay, that'll do it for us here on the 4 o'clock news on air and the streaming app. Let's pass it over to Pete and Bonnie now for the 5 o'clock news. All right, Nora, sounds good. Thank you so much. And your look at what's going on in both news and weather is coming up in the next 12 minutes on 12. The 5 o'clock news starts now. Now at 5, impeached again. President Trump makes history as the only president to be impeached twice. His message to the nation after the vote. Plus, a January storm creates a mess across Oregon. A family races to escape as a mudslide wipes out their home. He was on the stairs as they collapsed. I'm trying to help get me out. A major Portland artery blocked. And right now, the effort to find a driver caught up in a major mudslide. Team coverage in the next 12 on 12. Good evening and welcome to the 5 o'clock news. I'm Pete Ferryman. And I'm Bonnie Silkman. Thanks for being here with us yet again for another busy night of news. Tonight we can tell you for the first time in history, a U.S. president has been impeached twice. That's just one big story we're following right now. Now today the House of Representatives made that historic decision. It happened just hours ago, one week after the deadly riot at the nation's capital and one week before the presidential inauguration. You see the capital there on the left side of the screen. We're also following what's happening there on the right side of your screen, closer to home, where we're seeing fallout from heavy rain and wild weather that hit our region. This is a live look from Air 12 at this hour on the right there, where crews are searching for a driver believed to be swept away in a landslide in eastern Multnomah County. So scary. And just listen to this. A family in Astoria, Astoria had to get out of their house fast when a mudslide pushed their home right off of its foundation. Look at that damage. They said they knew it was time to get moving around 3 o'clock this morning when they could hear a cracking sound and glass breaking. Fortunately, everyone is okay. 
hard to imagine what that really mm. would have sounded like, right? In the Portland metro area, slides are blocking critical roads. Look at this, uh, West Burnside, where the city says a slide will keep that road closed through the weekend. There's another big landslide we're seeing on SR 14 east of Carson in Skimania County. That's where a giant boulder slammed down onto the highway, blocking traffic. This highway is now back open to smaller vehicles. Now, this January storm is also prompting evacuations, flash flood warnings, and a power outage. In fact, 33,000 people are without power right now. We do have live team coverage for you with meteorologists Mark Nelson and Brian McMillan, both standing by. First, let's get out to Fox 12's Kendra Kent, who is live in Dodson. That's where landslide a major landslide there prompted evacuations Kendra what's happening there well, we're fighting daylight right now, but we actually have a pretty good vantage point. So I'm going to step out of the way. I'm going to show you what we're seeing here. We're on the other side of I-84, but if you see those four big fir trees right there, that's where deputies do believe that the woman's car went missing somewhere around there. And then you can see behind there all of that mud and there's even, even a, a little stream trickling down right now. And if we go back to those trees, you can see how you can barely see their stumps there. They're covered in mud, and we're told that that is about 10 feet or more of mud right at that spot, and that's why you can't see more of the trunk. So just a little bit of perspective there. And ODOT says that there is concern that more of this area could be washed away if a dam of water breaks above. It's a tragic landslide that's all too familiar for this area along the Columbia River Gorge. This river of mud, debris, rocks, and a missing car and woman. You see the mud that's almost touching the bottom of the uh, limbs? That's at least 10 foot of mud. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office says 50-year-old Jennifer Camus Moore of Warrendale is missing after deputies believe her car was swept away around midnight Wednesday, where Highway 30 turns into Northeast Frontage Road in Dodson. The entire community of Dodson was asked to evacuate. That's about a thousand people who had to scramble to safety. Aston Smith says his partner woke him up around midnight. I woke up and go, yep, it's another one. So we were trying to get the cats around and everything like that. Smith says a small slide was just about 150 feet away from his house. The largest slide where the car was swept away is about 20 blocks from his home. We go down to the end of our road, try to take a ride. That's where the smaller landslide was. Couldn't get out that way, so the turn went down the other way and it is a total disaster mess. Smith says for everyone who lives here, it's an immediate reminder of the big slide back in 1996 that happened in nearly the same place. Living through 96, it was one of the most scariest things that I've ever had to go through. Boulders taller than me that were rolling down the road. Somehow, more than 20 years ago, nobody was hurt. As for the missing woman, deputies say it's too dangerous right now for search crews to look for her. And even major cleanup is out of the question. Back out live, we want to give you another look from Air 12 right now over this area showing the landslide. And remember, this is the burn scar area of the Eagle Creek fire, which means it is, of course, now even more high risk for landslides like we just saw overnight and early this morning, especially after all of the storms we've been having recently. And earlier, first responders did try to use thermal heat imaging to find any hot spots where this woman and the car might be. They did not have any success with that. I-84 eastbound is still closed at this time from Troutdale to Ainsworth State Park. And last we spoke with ODOT, there is no time frame for when that will be reopened. Of course, we will keep you posted as we learn more details. For now, reporting live tonight, Kendra Kent, Fox 12 Oregon. Scary situation out there. Kendra, stay safe. Thank you. As we follow the storm, we are following also sad and breaking news from Portland General Electric. The company says a member of its flagging crew was killed on the job. They were hit by a utility truck while helping restore power in the Mount Hood corridor. PGE calling this death tragic, saying that their hearts go out to that person's family and their loved ones. Such a difficult situation. You know, throughout the day, we've been seeing dramatic images coming in, courtesy of Air 12. The widespread damage showing just how quickly and intensely the storms can strike. Fox News' Brian McMillan has been monitoring some of the images throughout the day as they've come in. And Brian, you and the rest of the Fox 12 weather team, 
you, you predicted that we could see trouble like this with the, you know, the burn scars, the heavy rain, the erosion. Exactly. You know, out there in the Dodson area, of course, you had the Eagle Creek fire uh, out in that location. And, uh, you know, those areas are prone to landslides. And while things are dry out there right now, the damage is certainly done. Let's take you to the historic Columbia River Highway right near Multnomah Falls. In that area, we saw a lot of trees and debris coming down there earlier today. Not huge landslides, but still some trouble spots that we're keeping an eye on because of that soggy ground. Air 12 flew by a very active Multnomah Falls. Kind of a beautiful shot out there with water gushing. And uh, there's these images from the Mount Angel area. There they are, courtesy of a Fox 12 viewer. A fallen tree crushed a car there. Other trees pulled down wires, leaving neighborhoods in the dark. And there's also this dash cam video in the late uh, late this afternoon from a uh, Clackamas County Sheriff's Office. It uh, well, as we move back over to you guys, Sorry. I'll bring it back. I'm gonna no, bring it back. I gotta bring that camera back. And this actually shows a deputy driving on Highway oh. Highway 170 South of Canby when uh, that tree fell on his cruiser. Crazy. Look at that. Look at that damage right there. The end result, a lot of dense, shattered debris on the road, but the deputy wasn't seriously hurt, so good news there. But, yeah, uh, these types of rains can certainly pose a lot of damage, especially when you have the wind associated with it. Chief Me Meteorologist Mark Nelson is now here. Yeah, you know, I was driving home at the same, driving home at the same time last night, and uh, I, you know, was watching the cold front go by, and uh, I was concerned. I, I thought, well, will it, will it get extra windy with the front? And that's exactly what happened. In fact, the wind mm -hmm. was stronger than we expected from the west uh, and in an unusual direction. So a peak gust of 47 and many peak gusts just between 30 and 45 shouldn't have given us 90,000 PG outages. But I think two big things were going on last night. One is that wind came from an unusual direction. A westerly gust over 40 is very unusual. So trees aren't really used to that. The other is we just had many inches of rain, so the ground was all soggy and easier for uh, trees to fall down there. So, yeah. All right, look at the numbers here. We've got the final numbers since it stopped raining early this morning. Just under two inches of rain in Portland. That was a record for the date. And that was our wettest day in three years. So, yes, it was a huge soaker yesterday. Now, of course, we've gone over our typical January total. Now, look at these numbers. Just yesterday, eh, one and a half to two and a half inches on average across the metro area. Let's go into the gorge. Dodson. About five inches out of this storm, five to six inches. But if you go in those uh, mountains just to the south, remember it goes from near sea level up to about 4,000 feet within just like a mile or so. North Fork, there's a weather station up there just for uh, Bull Run Watershed, almost 10 inches of rain. So that's how you can suddenly get a mudslide with all that much water in such a short period of time. But of course, now things are much calmer. We'll let you know uh, when our next chance for showers is, and we'll check out some flooding rivers too. So stick around for that. All right, Mark, thank you. The House of Representatives has impeached Donald Trump for high crimes and misdemeanors. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, you see there, signing the article a short while ago. At about the same time, President Trump released a new White House video distancing himself from last week's violence. Mob violence goes against everything I believe in and everything our movement stands for. No true supporter of mine could ever endorse political violence. Certainly a historic day uh, for the entire country and one that Fox 12's Nora Hart is closely following for us. Yeah, a lot of people watching and this impacts all of us as Americans. In a slight contrast to the first impeachment, 10 House Republicans joined with Democrats to impeach the president. And the first time the vote was almost entirely along party lines. Also, today's vote comes exactly one week after that violent mob took over the Capitol in a deadly insurrection. An historic vote in Congress. House Democrats have voted to impeach President Trump for a second time. Exactly one week after that deadly siege on the Capitol, a bipartisan majority in the House impeached President Trump on one count inciting an insurrection. The President of the United States incited this insurrection, this armed rebellion against our common country. I cannot think of a more petty, vindictive, and gratuitous act than to impeach an already defeated president a week before he is to leave office. President Trump denied responsibility for the riot. Statement from the president 
I urge that there must be no violence, no law-breaking, no vandalism of any kind. This is not what I stand for. Unlike President Trump's first impeachment in 2019, this time a handful of Republicans voted with Democrats to impeach. Now, my vote to impeach our sitting president is not a fear-based decision. I am not choosing a side. I'm choosing truth. It's the only way to defeat fear. Yet most House Republicans argue that impeachment will ultimately do more harm than good. A vote to impeach will further fan the flames of partisan division. Although the House has the power to impeach, it's the Senate that holds a trial and can ultimately remove Trump from the presidency and potentially bar him from ever seeking office again. Senate leader Mitch McConnell's office says he will not bring the Senate back before January 19th. That means any trial likely will not take place until President Trump leaves office. Live in studio, Nora Hart, Fox 12, Oregon. All right, so much to cover. Nora, thank you so much. That does wrap up our 12-minute look at some of your top stories right here on Fox 12. And we have much more to get to, including Oregon Governor Kate Brown's trip to the vaccination clinic in Salem. What she's saying about the new plans for more widespread vaccinations and just how many doses Oregon gets per week. And under the governor's new plan, kids could be back in the classroom in the next two weeks. Hear what Portland Public Schools is planning to do. Plus, violence in the Capitol is having an impact on the president's personal holdings. The city that just cut ties with a Trump organization and how much money that could cost. Hello? Uh, sure. Sorry, you're taking up all this hard work. No okay, sounds good. Check, check, check. Hello? Can you hear me? Oregon is trying to ramp up the number of COVID-19 vaccines being given out. Yeah, tonight there is renewed reason for hope. After the governor's announcement of opening up the vaccine to more people, that's set to begin next week. So those 65 and older pre-K through 12 teachers and staff, among others, will be added to this first phase. Again, this starts next Saturday. And that group is estimated to be roughly 800,000 people in size. In Salem at the fairgrounds, they've had great success in getting those in the first phase vaccinated. Fox 12's John Hendricks is there live tonight, where the governor took a tour there today of the grounds. So, John, what did she have to say? Well, Pete and Bonnie, she told us today that this site is vaccinating up to 3,000 people a day. Now, yesterday, the National Guard began work here to help out with this vaccination effort. The governor says this model could easily be replicated to other parts of our state. 
Are you a medic? I am a medic. I'm meeting with the Oregon National Guard members at the fairgrounds in Salem today. Where are you teaching? Oregon Governor Kate Brown got a look at one of the state's largest COVID-19 vaccination clinics and met those stepping up for their community today in the state capitol. As soon as we can get more vaccines, uh, it for them, they're gonna they're gonna ramp it up. This site put together by Salem Health now has the help of the National Guard. They are vaccinating healthcare workers from Portland to Salem to all across the Mid Willamette Valley. It's truly an extraordinary effort. It is a courageous effort. When it comes to rolling this out across the state, the governor says it is possible and something that they're looking at. She says the issues they are having right now is an uncertainty of supply from the federal government. The state getting roughly 50,000 doses of vaccine each week. We do not have a sense yet of what the number of vaccines we're going to be getting regularly. Other county health departments are looking at similar plans as well. The Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems says hospitals across the state are preparing for that increase in those eligible to get the vaccine starting next Saturday. In the Portland area, work between health care providers and county health departments is ongoing in how to ramp up the vaccination effort. Back in Salem, the work will continue at the fairground, one vaccination at a time. This honestly is a star uh, for Oregon right now. The governor says the state is working on a ramped up vaccination plan. She told us today that the plan right now is to release it on Friday. Reporting live tonight, John Hendricks, Fox 12, Oregon.